Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we'll be continuing our discussion of conservatism in the skeptical tradition. Today, looking at the 20th century economist and political philosopher, F.A. Hayek. Uh, he's one of the um, founding fathers of libertarianism, uh, and he gives us a a, another take on a, a skeptical approach to the power of human reason, but where Burke focused more on social institutions, Hayek focuses more on economic institutions. So we'll go ahead and get started, uh, started with our discussion of Hayek. And so for Burke, if we remember, the danger of rationalism was that they undermine traditional forms of authority, things like class distinctions, the monarchy, and the church, all of which maintain a sense of social order and unity. And Burke was skeptical that these purely rational foundations to political life could provide the type of social co cohesion that these irrational or traditional or superstitious forms of social institutions provided. And then he worried that without these traditions that pr for him inculcated virtue and obedience and sociability, that the end result would be mob violence and authoritarianism. Now Hayek's writing 150 years after Burke, and he continues this skepticism about the powers of human reason. In the introduction to The Road to Serfdom, which I didn't have you read, he writes, is there any greater tragedy imaginable than that in our endeavor to consciously shape our future? In accordance with high ideals, we should in fact unwittingly produce the very opposite of that which we have been striving for. So again, like Burke, he's not necessarily questioning the motivations of his, of his political opponents, in this case, socialists. Uh, he's questioning whether or not in their attempt to make human life better and more just, they're actually going to make it more unjust. But where Burke focused on the dangers of replacing traditional forms of authority with those generated by philosophical reason, Hayek focuses on economics. Hayek's book is a warning against the idea that we could make the economy more rational through central planning, uh, where we could replace the chaos and competition and uncertainty of the free market with a more just and humane and, and, and rational economic arrangement. For Hayek, the enemy is not Rousseau and the Jacobins, uh, but the socialists, who he views as the intellectual heirs to the French Revolution. If Robespierre and the French Revolution offer one of the perennial boogeymen of conservative thinking, socialism is the other. And so in this lecture, our goals are to be able to explain Hayek's critique of economic planning, describe the relationship between Burkean skepticism and Hayek's critique, and to explain why and how Hayek defends traditional morality. And we'll get into these in, our, in the course of the lecture. We're going to start with contextual, a little bit of historical context and background on Hayek and the road to serfdom, thinking about why he calls socialism the road to serfdom, and then finally, is Hayek, I'm going to ask the question head on, whether or not Hayek actually is a conservative? And if so, what is he conserving? So Hayek, uh, F.A. Hayek, Friedrich August von Hayek, was born in Austria in 1899 and was the maternal cousin of the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. He served as an artillery captain in World War I on the Italian front and was decorated for bravery, he survived the flu of 1918. And after the war, he went to the University of Vienna, where he got, received uh, a, a completed doctorates in law and political science, while also studying philosophy, psychology, and economics. And he was originally sympathetic to democratic socialism, uh, but was converted to what he and others will call classical liberalism by the Australian, or Austri Austrian, not Australian, economist and philosopher Ludwig von Mises. And eventually, he received a post on the faculty at the London School of Economics, where he gained fame for his work on economic theory, uh, the coordinating power of price signals, and the, and the business cycle. He returned to uh, Austria. He, uh, he refused to return to Austria after the Anschluss, the union uh, between, with uh, Nazi Germany and Austria, and became a British subject, though he never returned to Great Britain after 1950, uh, but lived in the United States, uh, teaching at the University of Chicago. Uh, and Germany and Austria after the war, after the Second World War. Now, you might be familiar with Hayek uh, for his economic thinking. He received the Nobel Prize in economics for his work on the business cycle, in which he argued that this was not a natural uh, part of markets, but that the rise and fall of markets was stemmed from the money supply, and as central banks attempted to manage the economy by expanding and contracting the money supply, it actually wreaked havoc on the natural price signals of the markets. And in 1974, he won the Nobel Prize in economics for this work, but he actually shared the Nobel Prize with the left-leaning economist, Gunnar Myrdal. 
He also um, is well known for what he called the economic calculation problem. And we'll get into this a little bit today uh, because he believed that markets uh, were complex systems that would be impossible for us to have enough information about in advance to predict the right supply and, uh, of goods because we wouldn't know necessarily what the demand for those goods are. Therefore, for him, planned economies would necessarily lead to shortfalls or waste and that the natural evolution of price signals allowed for a more efficient coordination mechanism. We're going to get into this in a lot more detail today when we talk about um, his critique of planning. But he became famous in the 1930s for a series of deba debates with the influential uh, British economist John Maynard Keynes on macroeconomic theory and policy. Uh, for Keynes, unemployment and idle resources were caused by a lack of effective demand. But for Hayek, they stemmed from a previous unsustainable episode of easy money and artificially low interest rates. Hayek also criticized Keynes' response to the Great Depression arguing that the government spending was an ineffective way to promote economic growth and favored investments in public markets. Uh, and and this, this, this argument made, these arguments made by Hayek really became the origins of supply side economics as they became more popular in the Atlantic world in the 70s and 80s. Eventually, um, after the war, he took a post at the University of Chicago where he met Milton Friedman and became associated with the Chicago School of Ultra Free Market Orthodoxy. Uh, he's more closely associated with the idea of Austrian economics uh, with other Austrian emigres to the United States, such as Ludwig von Mises, Karl Menger, and Karl Popper. But as much as Hayek was an economist, he was deeply involved in a series of mid 20th century efforts to determine the intellectual contours of the post World War II uh, political order. As early as 1938, he participated in the colloquial uh, Walter, Litt Walter Littmann in Paris in which leading political scientists, philosophers, economists, journalists attempted to articulate a defense of liberal political economic order that would negotiate between old school liberalism, socialism, and fascism. And it was at this colloquium that the word neoliberalism was first introduced, and it was used not as a term of critique, as it often is today, uh, but the people, the members of this uh, colloquium actually described themselves as neoliberals, as we are ad advancing a new liberalism. Uh, he also, in many of his political writings, um, continued his, in many of his writings concern, concerned political affairs very uh, uh, concretely. After World War II, there was significant concern among Hayek and others in this kind of uh, lib uh, classical liberal Austrian economic circle that socialism was ascendant in academia and that it would lead to the destruction of the liberal order. Uh, and the what we're reading today, the road to serfdom, is an attempt to kind of whoops, is an attempt to challenge uh, challenge this argument. And but in addition to his intellectual work, he was one of the founders of and the first president of the Mount Pelerin Society, which was an organization of economists, political scientists, philosophers that aimed at promoting the ideals of classical liberalism. And in their statement of aims, they, uh, the society writes, over large stretches of the Earth's surface, the essential conditions of human dignity and freedom have already disappeared, and others there are under constant menace from the development of current tendencies of policy. The position of the individual and the voluntary group are progressively undermined by extensions of arbitrary power. Even in that most precious expression of Western man, freedom of thought and expression is threatened by the spread of creeds which claiming the privilege of tolerance when in the position of a minority, seek only to establish a position of power in which they can suppress and obliterate all views but their own. And you can see kind of echoes or, or uh, of debates that we're having now about free speech and tolerance and where, where we should draw the lines uh, uh, around these uh, debates echoed in these concerns that these debates have not gone away from this 1947 statement of aim, aims. And so if we, the, the Mount Pelerin Society uh, wasn't what became a very popular and, and, and well-connected uh, organization for right-leaning economists and, and conservative and libertarian economists, political scientists, and philosophers. And this is a quick video introduction. The Soviet Union is actively exporting communism to Eastern Europe. Mao Zedong is leading the communist revolution in China. To noted Austrian economist and eventual Nobel Prize winner, Friedrich von Hayek, these are ominous signs. In the spring of 1947, he invites an elite group of economists, political scientists, historians, and other intellectuals, including Milton Friedman, to consider the consequences. They call themselves the Mount Pelerin Society. 
for the Swiss town where they held their first meeting. So far as I personally was concerned, it was a very thrilling meeting. It was the first time I was overseas. The first time I ever met economists, political scientists, and other from other countries around the world. And it was organized because as of that time, the number of people around the world who were firm supporters of liberty, of a classical liberal point of view about human society, were very few and far between and were beleaguered wherever they were as a small minority. He came on the scene with what were perceived to be radical ideas in the 1950s and 1960s, largely because the influence of John Maynard Keynes was about fully pervasive, if I may put it that way. The Chicago economists were not popular in those days, and Milton Friedman led that group in not being popular. But we felt we had something to say because of what we learned, and um, it, was, it was exhilarating. So as you can see, uh, both another Nobel laureate, Gary Becker, uh, former chairman of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, both were members of the Mont Pelerin Society, um, the society that was formed in order to uh, promote free market thinking and individual liberty in the academy and in public policy. And, and Hayek continued uh, this kind of line of attack. In 1949, he published an article, The Intellectuals and in Socialism, which uh, expressed concern for the prevalence of left, uh, leftism in the academy as affecting society and called for those who hold liberal values to build a network to promote, and to promote the values of liberty and individualism around the world. Uh, so this kind of take, the calling for the creation of more things like Mont Pelerin Society. Again, this is an argument that continues to resonate to this day uh, with many conservative critiques of the academy as being, a, uh, as being irredeemably left wing. And, uh, in 1960, he wrote uh, which, what, the Constitution of Liberty, which was intended to be the definitive statement of Hayek's political philosophy. He argued that civilization is made possible by the fundamental principles of liberty, which were prerequisites for wealth, growth, and, and, and wealth and growth rather than the other way around. Uh, the Constitution of Liberty was notably held up at a British Conservative Party policy meeting and banged on the table by Margaret Thatcher, who reportedly interrupted the presentation to indicate holding the book saying, this is what we believe. So Hayek's thinking was quite influential in the development of, of conservative politics in both the United Kingdom and the United States. And this was made possible because of his work on creating a, what, uh, a transatlantic network of think tanks. Uh, the historian Daniel Stenman Jones argued in a 2014 book uh, that Hayek and the Mont Pelerin Society made good on this promise uh, to, to build a transatlantic network and this organizations were, uh, these organizations like the Heritage Foundation, the Cato Institute, the American Enterprise Institute, uh, were, became well positioned during the economic and political crises of the late 70s with a set of policy proposals and arguments that were then taken up by conservative leaders like Ronald Reagan in the United States, Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom, and have remained ascendant ever since. And so it's really, uh, many people trace our current like, neoliberalism to the type of thinking that Hayek was doing. So we're not going to read all of Hayek. Uh, and we're going to return to Hayek later, again, later in the course, and we look at some portions of the Constitution of Liberty. But today we're focusing on The Road to Serfdom, his 1944 book that was written between 1940 and 1943. And it was originally intended to be the second volume of a two-part project called The Abuse of Reasoning, uh, The Abuse of Reason. Again, this is calling back to conservative con skepticism over rationalist approaches to politics. And at the time, Hayek was at the London School of Economics, and he viewed that this book was his contribution to the war effort against Nazism. And Hayek was not only concerned with the dangers of Nazis winning the war, but he was increasingly concerned about what was happening in the Allies in order to win the war. While he was working on this book, the British war effort involved massively mobilizing the domestic economy to produce weapons and supplies, and required a significant amount of intervention and coordination into the market economy, large amount of central planning. And while uh, such planning could be justified in emergencies, Hayek was worried that such uh, efforts, experimental efforts and planning could be used as evidence for a more centrally planned socialist economy. And he saw evidence in this in things like the 1942 Labor Party platform, which seemed to confirm Hayek's fears, which called for a planned society that must replace the old competitive system, 
And the basis for our democracy must be the planned production for community use. And Hayek believed that many in the United States and Great Britain risked recreating the same social and economic conditions of interwar Germany, massively increasing state power in the name of planned economy, uh, placing these states on the road to serfdom. As he writes in the introduction, many who think themselves infinitely superior to the aberrations of Nazism and sincerely hate all its manifestations work at the same time for ideals whose realization would lead straight to the abhorred trinity tyranny. And the book was originally published in Britain in the spring of 1944, uh, but Hayek had trouble finding an American publisher and was only able to get it published by the University of Chicago Press uh, because a, the economist Aaron Director spoke to friends of his there. It became immensely popular when, in 1940, April of 1945, the Reader's Digest published a 20-page uh, summary, an excerpt, uh, of the book that went out to several million households, and the book continues to be cited and referenced by conservative and libertarian commentators and thinkers today as one of the uh, definitive texts of North American and North, and North Atlantic libertarian or classical liberal political philosophy. So we're going to dive into the argument in, a uh, in more detail now, but if you need to take a break, now would be a great time to do so. So the main thrust of Hayek's argument has now become a common refrain among American conservatives and libertarians. Uh, the, the economic policies that seek to alleviate inequality or promote social justice uh, are intrinsic threats to individual liberty, uh, and they bring us closer step by step to totalitarianism. And he, on page 67, he contends that Totalitarianism in Germany and the Soviet Union were made possible not merely by contingent uh, circumstances in these countries, but by an overall rejection by the West of the freedom of economic affairs, without which personal and political liberty have never existed in the past. And this is leading to a new form of slavery arising before our eyes. And here Hayek's arguments sound very consistent with American conservatism. Individual liberty and free market econ economics are the hallmarks of Western civilization and should be preserved at all costs against the threat of socialism. And because this argument's been made so frequently by conservative talking heads against any form of economic policy, I'm sure many of you probably don't find this particularly persuasive. So let's reconstruct Hayek's thinking a little bit to understand his reasoning. So why does Hayek place such a premium on economic liberty? Uh, for Hayek, this, this liberty is the hallmark of Western civilization as emerging out of the combination of Christianity and the Renaissance recovery of the classical tradition. And he views that Western civilization is essentially an individualistic civilization, which he defines as the respect for the individual man qua man, that is, the recognition of his own views and tastes as supreme in his own sphere, however narrowly that may be circumscribed, and the belief that it is desirable that men should develop their own individual gifts and bends. This is from page 68 of your reading. So this might sound familiar to the emphasis on individual autonomy uh, from the Enlightenment, and there, but there are certainly some crucial differences between Hayek and people like Rousseau and Kant. For Hayek, and he makes this point explicitly in the supplemental chapter, uh, the supplemental reading, which is a chapter from a later book called uh, Reason and Evolution, that this type of individual liberty is not based on the ability to legislate laws from yourself, for yourself, like it is for Kant or Rousseau, where it is this ability to uh, will the laws. Instead, it's the ability to choose between two alternatives according to your preferences. Freedom is not this revolutionary ability to make something new from scratch, but it's merely this ability to choose what you prefer. And so uh, for Hayek, he is explicitly um, linking himself to the classical liberal tradition of people like John Locke, uh, John Stuart Mill, or at least the John Stuart Mill of On Liberty, not the John Stuart Mill of the chapters on socialism and on, on, uh, on um, or, or on unrepresentative government, or on, or on feminist politics. Um, but understood in this way, freedom here is best realized in the economic sphere, not necessarily the political sphere. Economic freedom, so being able to choose what job you have, how you spend your limited money, what you value and what you don't value, led, leads for Hayek to the transformation, this is on page 69, of a rigidly organized hierarchic system into one where men could at least attempt to shape their own life. 
Economic freedom creates further incentives for scientific and technological development as the free market rewards useful inventions. And as science and industry develop, the standard of living increases and spreads throughout society, which leads to further demands for political and social reform. Uh, as people are given more goods and resources and have a better quality of life, they demand to have more political and social equality uh, as well. And, and Hayek's narrative of the Western tradition culminates on page 70, where he says that by the beginning of the 20th century, the working man in the Western world had reached a degree of material comfort, security, and personal independence, which 100 years before had seemed scarcely plausible. So again, this is an argument that should be familiar to you from other more, more contemporary conservative arguments, that if this economic freedom is going to kind of boost the societal well-being overall. But, but for Hayek, He's worried that this success of economic liberalism is actually leads to its downfall and leads to people abandoning it. Hence, he calls it the abandoned, this first chapter, the abandoned road, road. As this economic liberalism is a generations long project of slowly improving society through economic freedom. Uh, and, and, but this, the, the success of improving society leads for people to demand progress even faster. And he writes on page 71, what had been an inspiring promise seemed no longer enough. The rate of progress far too slow, and the principles which had made this progress possible in the past came to be regarded more as obstacles to speedier progress, impatiently to be brushed away, than as the conditions for the preservation and development of what had already been achieved. And this desire for even greater material comfort and personal freedom becomes a demand for an entirely new approach to pop politics and economics. Rather than the slow march of progress through economic liberty, uh, people demanded a rapid transformation towards a utopian socialist society that could be designed from scratch through the use of power, use of human reason and use of modern science Rather than relying on the chaos and unfairness of the free market, we could rationally and scientifically organize economies to not only provide for a material abundance, uh, but also to ensure that everyone's needs are taken care of. This is the promise of socialism, which he calls in chapter two, the great utopia. And this project gained popularity by transforming the meaning of freedom, that, as Hayek uh, describes on page 77. Freedom no longer means this, uh, this ability to have personal choice and equal protection under the law, but becomes a freedom from necessity. Uh, this freedom from want in FDR's famous for freedom speech. Uh, whereas liberal freedom is primarily the freedom from interference in one's own life and choices, socialism for Hayek promises a freedom from hardship and toil and suffering through a rationally planned economy. And Hayek isn't doubting the motives here. This uh, socialism promises a, a He's, uh, socialism pr promises are sincere and based on a real desire to improve the human condition, but he believes that most of the people that support this project were misled and deceived based on misunderstanding the true roots of freedom and prosperity that were gained in the past few centuries, that the uh, misunderstanding that these forms of freedom were actually from the spontaneous organization of the market. And so the promise of greater prosperity and justice through a rationally planned economy sounds appealing, but for Hayek, it's doomed to failure because it makes a key flawed assumption, namely that centrally plan a central planning committee or individual could ever gather enough information uh, and knowledge to effectively organize as something as complex as a market and social system. As he writes in the supplemental chapter, uh, um, uh, reason and evolution, social relations are dynamic, constantly evolving and adapting to new circumstances and millions of facts which in their entirety are not known to anybody. The idea of a planned economy is based on the false analogy between a physical system in which we can make fairly accurate predictions based on our knowledge of starting conditions, right? We can predict like when a comet is going to appear or where a meteor shower is going to happen, things like this. Um, to social systems. And social system, Hayek argues, are more like evolutionary biology. Social sciences can recreate explanations of how of past events and make hypothetical predictions based on if different historical events occurred. Uh, but social science can't make blanket predictions about what the how the future of a complex system like societies is going to take place. 
But markets, however, for Hayek can solve these problems. They don't rely on any one person or collective body to have perfect knowledge. Instead, through market interactions, price signals emerge which guide the system towards a more efficient distribution of resources based on what people are willing to pay. Um, right? This is the basic logic behind supply and demand. Right? If you start running out of uh, goods in your store, that means that the demand is much higher than your supply and you either need to, you can need to charge more money for that, uh, for those scarce goods, and then, you, and then produce more of those goods. Likewise, if you have a bunch of food going bad on your shelves, it's not being sold, that means that you're producing too much of that, one, of that type of food, say bananas, more than the, what people actually are demanding for, and that's a signal that you should produce fewer bananas, right? But this doesn't require the shop, the, the shop, the grocery store to have knowledge of what everyone's food uh, grocery lists are going to be in advance. So not only are attempts to centrally plan economies doomed to failure and inefficiency because it's impossible to know every single detail about what motivates every individual's interactions in an economic system, knowledge that the participants themselves don't have, but these attempts are inherently dangerous. A planned economy means that some authority is empowered to make decisions about what goods are produced, how much of those goods are produced, where they are distributed, who's allowed to buy what. Such decisions, Hayek warns, inevitably means that some, the same governing body gets to make decisions about what we consume, what jobs we work, and what we value. And while this might seem Acceptable, since it would, a lot, it would just be a loss of freedom over economic factors, Hayek argues that, this economic, that these economic matters can't be separated from the rest of life. He writes on page 126, the question raised by economic planning is therefore not merely whether we shall be able to satisfy what we regard as our more or less important needs in the way we prefer it, it is whether we shall be able to decide what is more and what is less important for us, or whether it will be decided by the planner. What Hayek's saying here is that a free economy means we get to choose what we value by and what we're willing to invest more time and money on. For some of us, food is simply a means of fueling our bodies, while for others, cooking and fine dining are passions that bring immense joy in life. In a planned economy where the production, consumption, and distribution of food isn't a function of individual people uh, making choices about how to spend their money through economic exchange, but through one committee deciding what kind and how much of food should be produced, we lose this ability to determine what aspects of our lives are important and we find valuable. So we'll talk more about the free market and how the free market in Hayek's view better allocates resources in a way that maintains freedom later on this semester when we read some of the Constitution of Liberty. Uh, but for now, we'll conclude with Hayek's own conclusion on page uh, 132 of The Road to Serfdom. And he writes that the passion for the collective satisfaction of our needs with which the socialists have so well prepared the way for totalitarianism and which wants us to take our pleasures as well as our necessities at the appointed time and in the prescribed form is of course partly intended as a means of social edu of political education but is also the result of the ex exigencies of planning which consists entirely in depriving us of choice in order to give us whatever fits best into that plan and at the time determined by the plan. Where economic freedom not only efficiently allocates goods and services based on price signals of supply and demand, but preserves the individual's freedom to determine what is valuable to themselves, a planned economy would take away that freedom and in the name of social justice, require all individuals to value the same things to the same extent and in the same manner. And here he's worried that a planned economy that, that, that doesn't allow individuals to determine what they value and what's important is actually going to lead to a loss of diversity of opinion and preferences and values and a loss of individuality. That basically we reduce all of this diverse individuality of human beings into cogs, into a machine to ensure that the plan works. So we're gonna talk about how this is conservative, given all the emphasis on liberty uh, in just a minute, but take, this is a good, great time to pause this lecture and take a break if you need to. So you're probably thinking that Hayek doesn't sound like a conservative in the sense of like Burke, since he focuses on the individual over the collective. Uh, and he explicitly argues for individual freedom over traditional forms of authority. And he'll write an essay, he'll even write an essay in 1960 titled, Why I Am Not a Conservative, uh, that will be appended to the Constitution of Liberty. So what makes him conservative? There, I'm gonna suggest that there's three ways that re, or reasons why we should understand Hayek as a conservative. First, like Burke, Hayek's argument is premised on a skepticism about the power of human reason. 
economic planning is doomed to failure and results in turning human beings into dis uh, with, with distinct preferences and goals into these uniform cogs in the machine. Instead of trusting the powers of human reason to fully compute all the variables that would be necessary into an economic plan, Hayek believes that we should trust the impersonal knowledge of the market. In the same way that Burke trusts the prejudices and habits of tradition, even if we can't provide a rational account for them in the same way. So if we think of conservatism less as a form of unthinking obedience to existing authority and more as a cautious approach to historical change uh, that questions the ability of human beings to make societies from scratch, then Hayek clearly fits this mold. But uh, there are two other interesting ways that we can think of Hayek as a conservative. First, Hayek is preserving liber liberalism as the dominant social, political, and economic order. The title of chapter one of The Road to Serfdom is The Abandoned Road, and on page 67, he explicitly warns that we have progressively been moving away from the basic ideas on which Western civilization has been built. And so while Hayek is less interested in conserving the traditional class hierarchies, the role of the church and society, and the power of the monarchy, and all the other, higher, all the other habits, customs, and traditions that draped power in what Burke called pleasing illusions, liber Hayek is concerned with liberalism as a form of social, political, economic order. That liberalism's promise of political equality and economic freedom might have eroded these forms of authority since the French Revolution throughout the 19th century and into the 20th century. But Hayek views this such erosion as the hallmark of Western culture and views his work as an attempt to conserve this tradition of individualism from the threat of socialism. Like Burke's defense of a slow and managed change, Hayek doesn't defend the status quo as static, but defends liberalism as a leading to a gradual but eventual liberation of all people and creation of material prosperity. But he is ultimately defending the dominant political and economic order of the time in liberalism. And, and, and the, the, the third reason why Hayek is a conservative, this second distinct reason from Burke, comes more explicit in the supplementary chapter, uh, Reason and Evolution where he is completely con comfortable defending traditional moral norms and customs. And this might seem odd given his emphasis on individual tastes and individual freedom and individual preferences. But we have to think of like what a market is doing for Hayek. Hayek defends the market as a kind of giant impersonal computer. It's able to collect information and distribute, uh, and distribute goods and services more efficiently than any individual mind could ever accomplish. And this is because it's a dynamic system that adjusts with every new transaction or interaction, like we were talking about with price signals. Hayek thinks that our social norms evolve in a similar way. Moral norms and rules and social customs and prejudices are not deliberately constructed by anyone, but emerge as a kind of evolutionary process of trial and error. Uh, in which helpful and beneficial customs and habits and prejudices are preserved and maladaptive ones are forgotten. Thus, while he defends individual liberty in the realm of economic exchange, he does not extend this freedom to a critique of moral norms and custom. He's more than happy to conserve these because they are the results of a market-like uh, evolutionary process. As he writes on page 11 of the supplementary reading, man is as much rule-following animal as a purpose-seeking one. And he is successful not because he knows why he ought to observe the rules which he does observe, or is even capable of stating all these rules in words, but because his thinking and acting are governed by rules which have, by process of selection, been evolved in the society where he, in which he lives, and which are thus the product of an experience of generations. So Hayek will defend moral norms that are the results of this evolutionary process, but is critical of any attempt to impose rationally constructed moral, moral laws and social institutions. So for Hayek, there's no contradiction between his defense of individual liberty in the economic sphere and respecting traditional morality. And in many ways, Hayek anticipates the American conservative movement of the second half of the 20th century that blends this free market libertarianism and this traditional moral order, this conservative, uh, the religious right, this kind of conservative social systems into like one political movement here. Um, because he, 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 the way that he defines liberty purely in this kind of economic choice net, means of economic choice. So there's obviously much more to talk about with Hayek, even in the few chapters that we read for this week, but I'll wrap up here with some questions for you to think about as you finish the reading and get ready for discussion section. Is Hayek's argument about, uh, is, Hayek, sorry, excuse me, how does Hayek's context shape his argument? 
Are you persuaded by the argument that planned economies and socialism necessarily limit individual liberty? What are some of the advantages and disadvantages of looking at moral rules like evolutionary systems? And did Hayek's, I, did Hayek's argument surprise you in any way? Was his argument what, he, what you expected? Was it more or less persuasive than you thought it would be based on what, uh, your own kind of background knowledge of libertarianism or Hayek and what you might have heard? So that's going to be it for uh, today's, mini today's lecture. Uh, I'll see you all in discussion section on Monday or Wednesday. If you have any questions, please stop by office hours, uh, shoot me an email, uh, whether there are questions about the reading, questions about upcoming assignments, or anything else that's going on. Uh, I'm here to help and support you. Uh, and if not, I will see you all in discussion section. Take care.